Hello everyone, welcome to Edu Made Easy. We offer a collection of free resources for IGCSC and checkpoint exams. For more, please visit www.edumadeeasy.com. Today we're going to be solving Edu Made Easy's design question bank for the syllabus Chemistry 0620, Chemical Formulae and Equations. Let's get started. Okay, so the first question states that thallium hydroxide is an alkali and it has similar properties to sodium hydroxide. So these both are alkalis and alkalis are soluble bases, so they can be either metal hydroxides or oxides. Now we're asked to complete the following word equation, which is thallium hydroxide plus ammonium sulfate. So if you know, you don't have to know much about thallium itself, but the fact that is it is an alkali, just because it has, it's a hydroxide, right? So if you check the syllabus, you're supposed to know um, a reaction between an alkali and an ammonium salt. So we have an alkali and ammonium salt right here. And the products should be salt and ammonia and water. So you already know two products. So I'm just going to write ammonia and water. And these are consistent for the alkali and ammonium salt reactions. But the salt is going to be different according to what reactants are present. So the salt will be thallium sulfate. Thallium sulfate. Yeah, so that's that reaction. Now I'm able to complete the equation, which is basically the formula of the word equation we have just created. So, uh, okay, so this is thallium hydroxide. Uh, sorry, this is uh, sulfuric acid, not ammonium sulfate. So in this case, we know that already thallium hydroxide is an alkali. Sulfuric acid, you should be able to identify in its formula form. It's going to be an acid, right? Alkalis plus acids are what? We are neutralization reactor, reaction. So always the salt and water will be formed. So we'll have a salt here. And I'll just uh, write the formula for water there. Now the salt in this case would be thallium sulfate, right? So how do we write thallium sulfate? Uh, we're going to switch the valencies. So it would be Tl2 and SO4, just like this. Sorry, it's not 4 plus, it's just 4. Okay. Now we have all our products and reactants, but we haven't balanced it yet. So let's see, so we have two thalliums on the reactant, sorry, the product side, so we have to have two on this side as well. And then if you see, we also have, um, how much? Four hydrogens on the reactant side. So we'll put another two here, so it's equal. So now if you just double check if all your, um, all your elements have the same uh, number of moles on each side, we can see that thallium, there's two here, and there's already two here. Uh, two oxygens here and then six. So six oxygens on the reactants. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six oxygens here. Hydrogens, we have four here. And therefore, we have four here. And yourself only one. So that's all right. Okay. So everything is balanced and everything has been completed. Next question says aqueous thallium hydroxide was added to aqueous iron sulfate. Describe what you would see and complete the ionic equation for the reaction. So thallium hydroxide alkali aqueous iron sulfate. So this is kind of a test um, for cations. So what you're going to do is you have to memorize all of those tests. And it can be, uh, it usually is with sodium hydroxide and then aqueous ammonia. But for iron too, specifically, it's going to be a green precipitate. So you have to memorize the test for aqueous cations. So you're gonna green precipitate. I think solid would or green solid would also be accepted, but in the syllabus it specifies precipitate, so I would go for that. 
make sure you state the green color. Like you can't just write precipitate, state that it's the green precipitate for ion two cup. And then the observation, sorry, the equation, ionic equation, what we're going to do is, you can start off with thallium hydroxide plus iron two sulfate. And this is going to give you simply iron hydroxide, right? Iron two hydroxide. And then you simply just ba balance it. So there's two hydroxides on this side, so two. And that's how you do that question. Next we have ethanoic acid is a typical carboxylic acid. It forms ethanoates and we have to complete the following equation. So magnesium plus we have to balance this uh, gives us what basically? So magnesium being a metal and ethanoic acid being an acid basically, so you don't have to complicate this by knowing it's a carboxylic acid. That doesn't make anything com more complicated. It just means it's an acid, right? So this is your typical metal plus acid reaction. You would simply get a salt and hydrogen, right? So just write your hydrogen here. So your salt, it's going to be, um, so you're going to have to get the valencies of each. This is going to be minus. So then you just switch. So you would mg and then make sure to bracket it because this is very big and then this would be if you switch the two valencies. So let's try that here. And yes, that would be our answer. And now check if everything is balanced or not. So magnesium one here, magnesium one here, uh, CH3, we have two here, so I have to put two two here as well. And then everything should be balanced. Yes, everything is balanced now. Okay, and now we have the word equation, sodium hydroxide plus ethanoic acid. So this is a neutralization reaction again, because what, this is an alkali and this is an acid. So what would we get? We would get sodium hydroxide plus ethanoic acid. We're gonna get sodium ethanoate and water. So these are reactions you have to know. Simply knowing like metal plus acid, base plus acid, and what the uh, products are will enable you to remember it when you have like a situation where there's actually named like compounds. So sodium hydroxide, for example, I'm not, not going to remember that as sodium hydroxide, but as an alkali or a base, something like that. So next question asks us, um, tells us that 4.8 grams of calcium is added to 3.6 grams of water. The following reaction occurs. So we have calcium plus water gives calcium hydroxide and hydrogen. This is a metal plus water reaction as you can identify calcium is a metal. Now we have to write the number of moles of calcium and the number of moles of water. So it's, uh, it's very important to have a calculator around. So let me just open mine up. Okay, so the number of moles of calcium, how do we identify that? Let's draw our three triangles first. As I said in the previous video, these are very important to know. So we have mass, mole, MR. We have volt, volume, moles, 24. And then we have... and C V. Okay, so what we know here is the mass. So this is this is the triangle we're going to be using for this question specifically. So the number of moles of calcium, how am I going to do that? It's going to be mass divided by the molar mass. So the mass of calcium is already given here. And if you go to the periodic table, the mass number of calcium is going to be 40. It's estimated here, but it's 40. So simply what you have to do for the working here is 4.8, which is the grams or the mass, divided by the molar mass or mass number. And if we take our calculator, so 4.8 divided by 40, it's going to be 0 0.12 moles of calcium. So let's write that there. And we do the same for water. 
Water, how much water do we have? We have 3.6 grams. We are going to divide that by 18 because if you find the relative, um, uh, relative atomic mass of this, it's going to be two hydrogen. So that's going to be two plus 16 gives us 18. And now let's divide it again. 3.6 divided by 18. 0 0.2 moles of water. Okay, that's how you do that. And now it asks us which reagent is in excess. Explain your choice. So for the region to be in excess, it means it can't be like the smaller one. So let's just put a zero here to make it more simpler. So calcium is in excess, right? Because if you think about the moles of um, Right, sorry about that. Okay, so we know calcium is in excess. How do we know calcium is in excess? Because since we because 0 0.12 moles of calcium will need 0 0.24 moles of water, right, to react. But there is only 0 0.20. Since there is the molar ratio of 1 to 2, How how there's like not enough water, right, to react with the calcium. So calcium is in excess. So we'll write calcium is in excess, and then it says to explain our choice. So why is why how do you know it's in excess? It's because the zero point one two moles of calcium needs. 0 0.24 moles of water. So therefore, it has not enough water because calcium is in excess, right? So that's the answer would be. Um, otherwise, you could word it like this. You could say that calcium is in excess again because the molar ratio of calcium to water is like 3 to 5. Uh, which is bigger than the required molar ratio of 1 to 2. So otherwise you could say it like that, but I think the easiest way to be would be to say it like this. Okay, calculate the mass of the reagent named in the second part, which remained at the end of the experiment. So that's going to be calcium, how much remained at the end of the experiment. So simply what you're going to have to do is just... times this, so mass would be the moles times the molar mass, 40, so that's going to be 0 0.8 grams. Okay, let's move on to the next question. It says malic acid is an unsaturated acid. So what does that mean? Unsaturated acid means it contains double one or more double double carbon bonds, right? So those are like this. 5.8 grams of this acid contain 2.4 of carbon, 0 0.2 of hydrogen, and 3.2 of oxygen. How do you know that the acid contain only carbon, hydrogen, oxygen? So simple way is just to check if these values add up to 5.8. So we're going to see 2.4 plus 0 0.2 plus 3.2 and that's going to give us 5.8 so we know it's only carbon and hydrogen oxygen making up this acid so we're going to just going to write adds up to 5.8 grams now we're going to calculate the empirical formula of maleic acid okay so let me just draw three triangles again because that's very helpful
Okay, so the number of moles of carbon atoms. How do we know that? We have the mass of the carbon. We have to know the moles. So what is going to be? It's going to be 2.4, which is the mass. And we're going to divide it by 12, which is the mass number. That's going to be 0 0.2 moles of carbon atoms. Now for H, uh, hydrogen, we're going to do the same. Hydrogen, that's 0 0.2. And we divide that by 1. So that's, again, going to be 0 0.2. And then the number of moles of oxygen atoms, it's going to be 3.2 grams divided by 16. And often, times people make the mistake to do 32. But remember, we don't know how much oxygen there is. But if it says atmospheric oxygen, definitely do O2, which is going to be 32. But we don't know, like, this... um like acid how much oxygen it has it's only an acid it's not atmospheric so just put 16 consider oxygen as like one so 0 0.2 again now since uh, we have to check the ratio so it's obviously going to be one to one to one so that means the empirical formula is going to be cho so that's that next question Cyclopropane is a colorless gas. Cyclopropane reacts with bromine at room temperature. The chemical equation for the reaction is shown. So propane undergoes these reactions. Um, addition, sorry, not addition reaction, substitution reactions like this. Uh, what is the empirical formula of cyclopropane? So we have to just count the number of carbons and hydrogens here. So there's three carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six hydrogens. We can divide both sides by three, so it would be CH2. Remember, empirical formula is the simplest whole number ratio of like the different atoms in a uh, compound, right? So just remember, that's the simplest whole number ratio, the simplest it can be. Okay, next question. What color change, if any, would you see when cyclopropane is bubbled into aqueous propane? So cyclopropane, remember, is an alkane. So it's on um, it's, it's sorry, it's uh, saturated, right? So initial color of bromine obviously would be like orange. And then it would be colorless. Okay, um, so in other gases present in Neptune's atmosphere include ethane and water vapor. Calculate the relative molecular mass of ethane, C2H6. Use your periodic table to help you. So you're supposed to know mass number of carbon is 12, and for H it's 1. So C2 means 24 plus 6, so that's going to be 30. Uh, sometimes for like carbon hydrogen, it'll be useful to actually memorize the mass number. But I think if you do practice, you'll automatically memorize it. So carbon is 12, nitrogen 14, oxygen is 16. Um, what else? Helium is 4, hydrogen is 1, and others should be okay if you uh, look at the periodic table. But mostly it's those that are repeated. So that's worth knowing. And the next question says, a compound of sodium has the formula C4H8Ne. Calculate the relative formula mass of this to all, all your working. Use your periodic table to help you. So again, my main tip would be to write everything, uh, the mass numbers first. So as I said, carbon is 12, hydrogen is 1, and sodium, take a look at our periodic table. It's going to be 23. 23, yes, that should be right. Okay, and now let's see, there's four, uh, so it will be four times 12 carbon and plus eight and then just plus 23. Let's take our calculator and quickly do it. 48 plus eight plus 23. It's going to be 79. So just add up all the elements um, in that compound. Next question says, complete the word equation for the reaction of sodium hydroxide with sulfuric acid. 
So again, this is a neutralization reaction between a base and acid. So we'll get a salt and water. The salt here would be sodium sulfate. Okay, so we have a, it says phosphatite is another rock which contains a magnesium compound. A sample of phosphatite has the following composition by mass. Uh, so magnesium 2.73 grams, silicon 1.58, and oxygen 3.60 grams. Calculate the empirical formula of phosphatite. So my way of kind of attempting empirical formula questions would be to like draw a table with all the elements that are listed. So we have magnesium, silicon, and oxygen, right? The first thing I would do is like write down, uh, sometimes it can be percentages or it can be like masses like this. So in this case, it's masses. So I'm just gonna write everything accordingly. And then under this, I'm going to write the mass number. So for magnesium, it's going to be 24. For silicon, it's going to be 28. And for oxygen, it's 16, right? Remember, not O2, because this is a compound. We don't, it's not atmospheric oxygen, right? Um, so 16. Now we're going to divide um, basically 2.73 divided by 24 for all of these different elements. So 2.73 divided by 24 which is going to be 0 0.11375. And then for this one, it's going to be 1.58 divided by 28. Okay, let's round that up again to like 0 0.0564, 0 0.0564. And then 3.6 divided by 16. It's 0 0.225. Okay, so we wrote the, um, uh, it can either be the percentage or the gram first. And then we wrote the mass number. And then we wrote the divided answer. Now you're going to divide each of them by the smallest value you have gotten. So that's going to be in this case 0 0.0564. So let's divide these by that. 0 0.0564. And that answer, if you divide it, should be, let's see, 0 0.11375. 0 0.11375 divided by 0 0.0564 is going to be about two to a whole number, nearest whole number, and this is going to be one. And then we have 0 0.225 divided by 0 0.0564, which is going to be four to the nearest whole number. So now you can see there are two magnesiums, one silicon and four oxygens. So our empirical formula would be Mg2SiO4. That's how you get the empirical formula by doing it like this. So again, write the mass now, sorry, write the, yes, the grams or the percentage of each element that are in the question. So this will be given the question. It's nothing you have to solve. And then write the mass number beneath and divide the percentage of the grams by the mass number to get, usually it's a decimal value. Then you have to divide the range of values by the smallest number you have found and then you would get usually a whole number, but round to the nearest whole number. If not, and then you should be good to get the empirical formula. Okay. This question is about masses, volumes, and moles. Which term is defined by the following statement? So they've given us kind of the definition. They want us to know what is like the term that matches to this definition. The average mass of naturally occurring atoms of an element on a scale where the 12 cc atom has a mass of exactly 12 units. So whenever you see 12C6, it's always about relative atomic mass. So that's relatively easy. Now it says butane, C4H10, has a relative molecular mass of 58. Potassium chloride, KF, has a relative formula mass of 58. 
Now, this is a very good question because I also get confused with relative formular mass and relative molecular mass. So, one thing to know is molecular is always for covalent, always for covalently bonded um, molecules because molecules can only be called, like you can only call molecules things that are covalently bonded. Formula we call for ionically bonded compounds. So, we can use compounds in that but never can you say molecule, molecules for compounds. So what you're going to say is butane is covalent. That's why it's called like molecule, molecules. So if it's a covalently bonded, you're going to call it a molecule. But if it's ionically bonded, you're going to call it a compound. So there you go. That's something even I get confused with. But that's okay. Just remember to know the difference between relative molecular mass and relative formula mass before you kind of go around saying those things in your exam. Okay, so that's all for this unit. Uh, my main tip again would be to just kind of memorize these three triangles. Those are very important and they're so easy. Um, and also uh, regarding the periodic table, again, know your math numbers for some of the mo mostly commonly repeated ones like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, maybe sodium, magnesium, calcium, or kind of the group one metals as well. And yes, that's basically all for today. And thank you so much for watching.